Hi everyone and welcome to this AP Environmental Science lecture in regards to studying the state of the earth part two. We're going to look at two things today. Uh, first thing we're going to hopefully review the scientific method, the steps it takes in regards to making an observation, creating a hypothesis, collecting data, and then in turn reading that data. But we're also going to look at the environmental science aspect to, um, to it. And what I mean by that is the cartoon on the right does hold a little truth as in regards to you all know that in every good scientific uh, experiment and if you're following the method that um, there's always this control group there's always yes you have an experimental group where you're changing some variables but in the end you have this group where you're comparing it back to what were the changes um, and how did those take place the problem we have with environmental science is we don't have another Earth. So there's not this other planet with the same life forms, the same atmosphere, uh, the same amount of water, and so on. And in addition to these living organisms that are manipulating the environment, like humans, um, burning fossil fuels, changing the composition and chemistry of the atmosphere, which in turn increases the temperature of the ocean. So these are some challenges and limitations environmental scientists um, face. and from here on out we're going to look forward on how one they take on those challenges and what we have learned from previous um, findings so for the past 200 years we've essentially built on prior knowledge and learned quite a bit of information um, going back again it was 1896 where that first term that we hear a lot today global warming was was brought up and again it's through this scientific method that we've realized that you know going back over a hundred years unfortunately it's still a debate you have this science scientific consensus agreeing on a um, certain cause and effect and it's all going back to the scientific method and I think the most perfect example is um, from a physician in the 1850s that uh, lived in London and during that time, what was happening, there was this cholera outbreak. And um, what we know now, and which we didn't know then, before Jon Snow, is cholera is the result of uh, E. coli in your water, so feces. And um, so what Jon Snow is a, did was a perfect example of the scientific method, because science is a process. So there's certain steps we take, and you've done this before. First, you observe and you question. So... John Snow was curious, you know, why are um, people getting sick? What do they all have in common? There must be this common denominator. So we formed this hypothesis, you know, and there could have been many hypotheses. It's the air they breathe. It's the job they have. It's the, the water they drink. And from that, you, he, you know, you collect the data. He collected the data. And um, what he found out is that after looking at, her, at his results, it was – this one area in the part of town. So John Snow collecting his data is um, each dot represents a death. And you can see each pump here is a access for water for those people in the area. And you can see it's heavily populated. There's many, many deaths um, near pump A, which John Snow concluded, you know, it must be something that the people around that area share and Sure enough, it was the water. The water was actually um, very, very close to an old sewage plant. So what was happening, um, or sewage depository, and what was happening was E. coli and fecal matter was getting into the pump A, pump A result in that ba bacteria just growing and making people incredibly sick. So again, great example of the scientific method. You went through all those steps and came up with the conclusion that in turn, uh, saved a lot of lives. So we're going to go through each step. Um, again, hopefully they're review, but first what we're going to do is we observe and we question. And from there, once we observe something, we're going to develop this hypothesis. And it's an educated guess. And the key word there, I think, is educated. And especially important is, can it be supported or rejected? Can you say yes or no? If X happens, Z is the result. So it helps us explain this data and this phenomena um, and what's happening um, in our daily lives and even in Earth's uh, systems. 
and from there we can make predictions. That's where you see where you um, on the news you hear there's predictions where there's a certain number of meters sea level rise by the year 2100. It's because looking back at this data, uh, rejecting hypotheses, and um, even accepting them, we come to our conclusions. And it's important to note that there's this null hypothesis, and what happens a lot in environmental science, sciences, that it's easier to prove something wrong than true beyond a doubt. So essentially what we do in environmental science is this process of, of elimination, you know, just like Jon Snow, was it the air they breathe, you know, research that, no, and did all these checklists, and it was a process of this elimination, and that's what we use a lot in environmental science. So from there, we're going to collect data, and we're going to do this quite often this um, this year, and what we're doing is we're just taking several sets of measurements, and it's very, very important we have this sample size, and what can happen is if a sample size is too small, we can get results that are t uh, very misleading. In the case of, let's say, randomly you select, select three people of those three people at random they all have a size shoe of a 10 you assume that everyone that you pull or everyone has a um, size 10 shoe size whereas had you asked 100 people what their shoe size was I think your results would be much different so we're looking for is a large sample size which will allow us to get to this accuracy which refers to how close a measured value is to its true value, and then even precision, how close we get repeated measurements, how if we do the measurement or the experiment more often, do we keep getting the same uh, results? And finally, there's this likelihood that some measurements may change with the range, even though throughout all the other experiments that were made. Um, you know, how are you sure? <clears throat> per example is currently 97% of scientists there's a consensus that global warming is occurring and is human induced so there's is an uncertainty of three percent of scientists out there that say you know it's not human induced it's something else and that's where environmental science going back to that control we have no other plan to relate to but if you look at the numbers and there's a 97 percent chance you're ill um, you know, or 97% of the doctors say that you, you know, have cancer, it's probably likely that you're going, you know, you're sick and you're ill. So there is that uncertainty, but it's also going to rely on, uh, look at st statistics and percentages. So the far left is what we're looking for in environmental science. We want our uh, repeated experiments that have high accuracy and high precision. And finally, as we go throughout the scientific method, there's two types of data we're going to collect. Quantitative is numbers. We're just looking at numbers here, and I apologize. It's kind of flipped around. Quantitative is over here, and it's easily measured. We can do a length. We can do a height. These, this is where we'll see our graphs, whereas qualitative is our descriptive, you know, colors, um, taste, smells, things of that nature. But it's the combination of the two that will lead us to this uh, conclusion in the end that will either reject or accept our hypothesis. All right, before moving on though, we're going to have to look at something that deals specifically with environmental science and that's um, a natural experiment. So not all experiments can be done in a controlled environment. So for example, it would be extremely difficult to um, study the interactions between a wolf and caribou populations because we could not get this controlled setting. They both need large amounts of land. Uh, wolves, you know, will cover vast quantities of an area and um, there's no possible way you could do this in a, in a uh, controlled environment. You know, even in zoos, we don't really understand animal behavior in zoos because it's not their um, natural habitat. So we call this a natural experiment. And what sometimes we get lucky and we can, um, certain things can happen to an area like a volcanic eruption. On the right here is uh, Mount St. Helens after the, it erupted in 1980. But this is a 
great example or a volcano is a great example of a natural ex experiment because it provides us with understanding in a large scale area. I mean, the last thing you want to do is wipe out an entire forest and then s see how it comes back. So what the volcano, what Mount St. Helens did was allow us to see the progression of a forest in the area that it was cleared. So again, natural experiments are found and the problem is the results can be very difficult to interpret because again, we don't have this control. There's many variables um, and we are, in order to do this, we have to observe areas that were not affected, but we'll run into a lot in environmental science. So we have to use reasoning. There's two types of reasoning when we are interpreting our results. There's the inductive. It's these specific measurements that arrive us at our hypothesis, and it's a bottom-up approach, whereas the t um, deductive reasoning, what we're doing is we're using logic. First, we're getting a conclusion based on a generalization or a premise of what we understand, and it's a top-down. Here are the two. With inductive reasoning, you're starting with an observation and working your way up and uh, testing your hypothesis and maybe developing a theory, whereas the deductive, you're starting with a theory and are you going to confirm it or not? That's the question. I don't know if you're big fans. We all know about Sherlock Holmes. Maybe you saw this show in the uh, mid-2000s, early 2000s. I'm sorry, early 2000s. but And they're flipped from the previous slide. So just notice inductive reasoning is on the left here, deductive on the right, and of course, to make it inconvenient, they're switched up here. But it helps out because Sherlock Holmes was a deductive reasoner. He would come up with this theory, form a hypothesis, do his observations, and then confirm if his theory was correct or incorrect. Again, I don't know if many of you have watched House MD, the show, but he would develop this theory go back, observe the patient, look for patterns, get this tentative hypothesis, and move to a back to his original theory, either uh, dismissing or accepting it. So an example in environmental science is, notice I'm making observations. Perch have fins, walleye, all these fish have fins, and my conclusion is all fish have fins. That's inductive reasoning. Opposite of that, again, is deductive. We're starting, remember, with a theory. And this is my theory. All birds have feathers. I see an eagle. The eagle has the feathers, which makes the eagles are birds. So just know the difference between those two types of reasonings. Then what we need to do is disseminate our, our findings. And <clears throat> we're going to get more detail of this as we go on here, but nothing is ever proven in science. Um, all we can do is keep collecting data, keep uh, replicating experiments and supporting theories. So this hypothesis, if it's supported many, many times and the results keep coming back the exact same with different people doing the same experiment, we develop a theory. And then all well-supported theories become natural laws. And these are things we are just... Um, can't get around. So the conservation of matter, gravity, for example, is a law. So that's how we get our findings out. And again, this might not seem so, or might take you off a little bit, but there are no facts or truths. We just have these observations. We have data. And at the end of the day, data, especially numbers, don't lie. So we cannot prove something to be true. We cannot say fact, truth, or proven. Um, but again, if, you know, 97% of scientists say that global warming is occurring due to human uh, actions. You know, 97% is a pretty good, um, good number that it, it, we are, you know, part of the problem. If, you know, something were to happen 97% of the time you came to school and failed a test, you're not doing so well. You're probably not going to pass school. So, again, those numbers are what we rely on for our data. Looking at our baseline, there is, we're going to look at these four individually in detail right now. First, we're going to start with our baseline, and again, that's this, we don't have this control. Subjectivity of humans, interactions of humans, and notice we're always kind of the one involved presenting these challenges in environmental science. So our, going to our uh, lack of baseline data, what we mean by this is that we don't have another Earth. To compare it to. We don't have in the 
graph on the right, which is these temperatures going back more than 50 years. We don't have long-term data. So again, there's no control error. So, you know, for example, we can dig ice cores in Greenland and find lead that was uh, produced by humans hundreds of years ago. Um, PCBs found in plastics are now found in the fatty tissue of penguins. And then even invasive species from early explorers. So what we need to do as environmental scientists is we need to speculate since we don't know what the original earth and conditions were like before humans. Another problem we run into is subjectivity. How do you look at something? You've all maybe gone grocery shopping and uh, been given the option paper or plastic. You know, which one does have the least impact on the environment? To create that paper bag, they did have to use a decent amount of chlorine that ends up in our waterways. Um, to make the plastic, they use benzene, which is a toxin. So, you know, how do you look at it? Is chlorine in the water affecting fish or benzene and or burning uh, petroleum to make the plastic? You know, these involve judgments and values and personal opinions. And at the end of the day, there's no right or wrong answer. Another example we talked about was DDT. You know, it's horrible. It's, um, eagle's eggs were becoming soft and they were becoming endangered. But then again, mosquitoes uh, carry malaria that could re, you know, affect the human population. So again, where do you side? And it all goes back to this subjectivity of personal opinion and values. So sometimes there is no right answer. Looking at interactions. In regards to interactions, give me a moment. Most of the systems on Earth are intertwined. You can't, they're affecting each other. They're, you know, the water cycle is involved in the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle. And we can't just study one system easily on its own. Uh, per example, we have to create models and to understand that things get complicated in regards to systems. And what happens is when they function, going back to that inter interacting with each other, we, ha we can't just focus on one specific interaction. So we have to take for um, consideration that all these other systems are occurring at the same time. Human well-being. In regards to the human well-being, we have to understand that, you know, we have an impact on the biological and natural resources of this world. And we all know certain people in the world don't live. There's not an equity between the uh, standards of living across the world. Example of that is I'm someone who has a difficult time day by day make, uh, getting their basic needs filled. And when I say basic needs, that's food, water, shelter. Someone who's struggling to meet those needs, the last thing on their mind is energy consumption or pollution or you know fossil fuel use so this human well-being aspect is a challenge in environmental science as well and finally we have these parts of a system there's things coming in in regards to the energy a lot of it involves the sun and then what happens as the energy goes through the cycle this could be a food web this could be the water cycle and then sometimes it's stored uh, you will see a lot of the carbon that is was initially put into the atmosphere, a lot of it was stored in shelled organisms. They evolved to create sh uh, their sh protective shells out of that carbon that was in the atmosphere and then uh, dissolved into the water. And then eventually, how does it get out? You know, So it's this system, and you've seen the models with the arrows of things going in, things coming out, and they're very, very complicated because this nitrogen cycle does, doesn't occur in this small area in the picture. It's a worldwide phenomenon. So there's still just more simple, though, to create and to get the message across on how the natural world works. And we're going to end up here, and there's two types of science. Our first one is the frontier. Think of, you know, when explorers or pioneers were moving west, they called that the frontier because everything was new and um, we didn't really know much about it. So these are the newer theories. When we say they're often contentious, that means, you know, 
there's a lot of skeptics out there. And notice evolution was on the frontier in the 1800s. It is now on the consensus side. And we, when we say consensus, that means, again, that 97% of scientists agree that global warming is human-induced. That's a consensus. It shouldn't be on the, it's not on the frontier anymore. So those are things like the laws of motion. Now, you know, again, we've come far enough through um, more experiments and more data and more research in regards to evolution. Evolution is now a consensus. Yes, global warming is a consensus. So know your two types of science. Again, frontier is more than new age stuff. Consensus is what's been around. And those that scientific method, those experiments keep going back to the same conclusion. That wraps up our lecture on studying the state of the earth. As always, you know, you have the website. You can go check it out. We'll see you later.